This workshop today is basically about the law, which is the underpinning of all business. We'll be looking at the history of law, how it's developed over time, and then we'll go into a bit of detail about commercial law, specific aspects of it, and employment law. It's important for graduate learners to attend a workshop like this because it will feed into their day-to-day -day business activities, and they will learn a great deal about the practical aspects of business and law. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for turning up. Nicola is uh, in charge of all commercial legal work. I, my specialism is in employment law. We are both fully struck on solicitors with practicing certificates. I think our combined years of experience doesn't quite equate to the Rolling Stones combined age, but probably not far off. Nicola and I are gonna split up how we talk to you. I'm gonna start giving you a quick rundown on the legal framework what are laws, how do they come about, why do we have them. Nicola will explain the sort of structure of the uh, organisations, the bodies that deal with uh, legal questions. I will tell you more about how law gets to be made. Nicola will then go on to talk about <coughs> contract law and some commercial law generally. Then we'll have lunch and then I will talk about employment law, particularly unfair dismissal and discrimination. You need to have some sort of legal framework in order to have laws. The rule of law, what is that? That is the basis of any sort of legal system. It means that everyone should be subject to the law. If you, if you can't see what's going on in your court system, then the rule of law is in danger of breaking down. So we don't need to be look too far from where we're sitting to see that the, the rule of law can be breaking down within our own environs. There are two main types. There's criminal law and there's civil law. You, in your business life, will be subject to both of them. The criminal law, the burden of proof in criminal cases is beyond a reasonable doubt, which makes sense because uh, one of the penalties in criminal law is going to jail. If you're going to be deprived of your freedom, the courts or the juries or whoever might, must be pretty damn sure that you've done whatever it is you're being done for. In civil law, it's the balance of probabilities. If it's 51% more likely than not that something happened, there will be a finding against you. So it's an easier test to pass for anyone who's um, bringing a case against you. Anybody like to give me some idea of some criminal activities? Theft. Oh, we're getting very CSI in Miami here. Fraud. Speeding, parking fines, drunk driving, but in the business context, there's all sorts of other things. That health and safety, immigration, corporate manslaughter, supply for fraud. There is a new, new law coming in that says if you supply um, some kit that you know is going to be used to, for instance, forge passports, then you are committing a criminal offence. Anti-competitive behaviour can be a criminal offence. What sort of penalties for criminal law? Fines, jail, community service. Uh, they're different to civil law and civil law. Damages would always be money, an injunction to stop somebody doing something, or specific performance to make somebody do something. Who in criminal law are the investigators and the prosecutors? Well, the investigators are the police. But not only the police, it could be, you said health and safety earlier, it could be the health and safety executive, it could be trading standards, in criminal matters, uh, you, uh, you either go before a magistrate or you go through before a judge. And if you go before a judge, you're likely to have a jury. Some foreign people say that they think juries are a very bad idea. Why would you want a whole load of untrained people deciding whether or not you've done this thing, whatever, this terrible thing, whatever it is? Because other countries don't have juries in the same way that we do. We defend our jury um, system to the death saying, but juries are normal people who take a sensible approach when the judges and the lawyers are just going over the top. The representatives are the same for both <coughs> criminal and civil. Solicitors, Nicola and I are solicitors. 
or barristers. Barristers traditionally are the ones who stand up in court and do all the fl flim flam. The solicitors are the one who, ones who've done all the hard work behind the scenes. <laughs> <coughs> there are two types of civil law. One of them doesn't have anything to do with the courts, non-contentious law, which is what the vast majority of the huge um, magic circle firms in London, they do very little litigation work, i.e. contentious work. What they're doing is the non-contentious work, i.e. drawing up massive contracts to protect you against every single possible eventuality in your new venture with some Russian oligarch. A, a lot of law, and very expensive law, has got nothing to do with the courts what, whatsoever until it all goes wrong. Uh, company law, another big area of civil law, in intellectual property, defamation, anything that is, doesn't have a criminal um, sanction is a civil law legal matter. You do not have juries in civil law trials, you only have a judge. We need a system uh, to enforce it and to administer it. So that's why we have uh, courts and tribunals. And uh, the aims, and we call this the justice system, apparently, and according to the current Ministry of Justice, the legal system needs to uphold fairness in society, and both in business and for individuals. Essentially, that's quite a, a laudable aim, you'd think, wouldn't you? I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a, a, an ambitious thing, isn't it? You know, to provide fairness for everybody. That's an aim which is not often reached um, because effectively the, the, the courts and tribunal system just isn't big enough. Other systems of justice, particularly the French system, if anyone have had any experience of the French system, that's inquisitorial. So in those sorts of European systems, what you have is um, a judge or a magistrate is appointed to a particular matter and they have an investigatory role, so they will be asking questions. But our judges don't do that, our courts don't particularly do that. They decide cases based on what the parties bring to them um, and the evidence that, uh, that the parties put before them. And I would say the role of lawyers in criminal matters um, is, is even more important because essentially we stand between the state and the individual to make sure that the state treats the citizen properly and in accordance with the rule of law. All this stuff on this side is basically state versus citizen stuff. And all this stuff on that side is basically citizen versus citizen stuff. Every single criminal case that starts in this country starts in a magistrate's court. But the other sort of state versus citizen stuff that your magistrates deal with is things like adoption of children, non-payment of your council tax, non-payment of your TV licence. Serious cases, so things that the magistrates don't have jurisdiction over, so you're talking serious crimes like murder and some theft, robberies, will be indicted <coughs> to the Crown Court. The, the magistrate court will say, is there a case to answer? If we think there is, they'll commit them up to the Crown Court and that's where you get your jury trials. Appeals from the Crown Court go up to the Court of Appeal, the criminal division, and then ultimately would go to the Supreme Court. But most of the stuff that you're going to be involved in in your day-to-day -day working lives, if you have anything to do with the courts at all, is going to be on the other side of, of that screen. So your debt collection matters, your contract disputes, those sorts of things are going to be in the county court or possibly the high court for very high value cases. And your employment matters are going to be in the tribunals over here. Right at the top of the structure, now we've got the Supreme Court. Since October 2009, we've had the Supreme Court in place of the House of Lords. So why is it so complicated? Well, it is complicated because our system of justice goes back for a thousand years, right back to trial by combat. And you can still see some of the elements in some of the names that we give things. The High Court, for example, has got two divisions there called Queen's Bench and Chancery. And that's because back in ancient times, you few were very rich and you had a dispute with your neighbour or someone had murdered your wife, you might petition the king. Jurisdiction. We have a bit of a jurisdiction problem um, because the main court structure is England and Wales. Scotland and Northern Ireland have got slightly different systems and the Supreme Court covers all of it. It sometimes comes up that a client will say to us, what if this document disappears? What if I say this? Our first duty is to the court. And we can get into a lot of trouble if we know that somebody is lying 
and we promulgate that through the court and allow them to give witness evidence. You cannot <coughs> defend them if they tell you outright that they did it. If you say you don't want to please get, plead guilty, I cannot act for you anymore. And that's the solicitor's fallback. But where, does, where do we make the law? It doesn't fall out of the sky. Where does it come from? These are the various sources. Equity, that's rather more interesting. People used to look to the king or the king's representative, who is the Lord Chancellor, for a, a more fairer, a more rounded result. And that's where the idea of equity came from. As you can imagine, the judges didn't like it. The equity survived the, um, the judges' uh, dislike and grew. And Lord Denning, who you may have heard of, was well, a great proponent. He kind of resurrected equity. Women got a very raw deal on divorce. And um, Lord Denning um, dreamt up all sorts of clever ways using equity to make divorce settlements fairer in his eyes. Statute law. The law is made by Parliament, but it's interpreted by judges. And every now and then you'll see a very red-faced minister having a go at how could the judges have made such a cock-up of his beautiful piece of law. Um, well, it's because the judges interpreted it in a different way. Uh, and if it's badly drafted so that the judges can get round it, if they feel like it, or can give it various different interpretations, then that's Parliament's fault. Now, Parliament can go back and amend the Act, because at the end of the day, Parliament is the, has the final say on the matter. And here are some examples of law made by Parliament. The Distress Act is the earliest Act of Parliament that is still extant, i.e. it hasn't all been repealed, it's still in use. The Distress Act of 1267 said that um, you must, any dispute that you have must be dealt with in a court of law. In terms of how the statutes come about, the green paper is a proposal. White papers then are after the green paper. That will include proposed legislation as a result of the consultation on the green paper. The bill is when the legislation has been drafted and is going through Parliament. When it's finally passed by Parliament, it becomes an act. There are also things called statutory instruments. They are quite a controversial thing because acts of Parliament will say, and the Secretary of State can make regulations about this, that and the other. Secretary of State can then come along and make all sorts of regulations and statutory instruments under that Act without really any um, discussion in Parliament at all. Of course, an awful lot of law these days comes from Europe. The Treaty of Rome in 1957 was the starting point. The European Commission makes laws which are a goal that EC states must achieve. If they don't do it within a um, time frame, the UK in this case can be fined quite substantially by the European courts. And of course, there's a lot of complaint about us losing um, our, our, our own sovereignty by having to bow to European law. European directives are things that we translate into our own law. European regulations are binding immediately. The other source of law, which isn't statute, is common law. And what that means is it's judge-made law. This is the only case that I'm going to tell you about. On the 26th of August, 1928, a May Donoghue went in to the Wellmeadow Cafe in Paisley with her friend. Her friend bought her a pear and ice cream ginger beer float. She poured out half of it, drank it down, poured out the other half, out plopped a decomposing snail. Miss Donoghue was found to be suffering from gastroenteritis as a result of this appalling thing that had happened to her. Now, Miss Donoghue wanted recompense, compensation for the fact she'd suffered injury. If she, Miss Donoghue herself had bought the ice cream float, the ginger beer float, from the shop, she might have been able to sue the shop. However, she didn't. Her friend bought it for her, so she couldn't sue the shop. She wanted to sue the manufacturer, but in those days you could only sue the manufacturer if they were producing something dangerous to start with. So if they were producing gunpowder or something like that, she might have had a chance, but ginger beer isn't inherently dangerous, so she couldn't. This case went all the way up to um, the House of Lords. Law Lord called Lord Atkin, and this is what he said. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbour. Persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. <coughs> what he did in that decision in the House of Lords was open up 
the entire um, tort of negligence. And that is the clearest example that I know of, of the common law um, acting as a, a source of law. We would always advise taking a commercial view. Have you got the evidence? Are your witnesses going to come up to scratch? Even in the best case, you cannot be more than 85% certain that you will win. Set that against what we call certainty or early receipt. So if you're owed 60,000, but the guy's prepared to settle for 30,000, gives you certainty, you know you're getting 30,000, and you're getting it now rather than six months' time when the case is finished, always worth bearing in mind. Think about alternative dispute resolution. Certainly, if you're worried about reputational risk, think about other ways that don't involve court. And also bear in mind um, whether or not the person that you're suing is a man of straw. OK, he owes you 60000 but his company's gone bust and he's, his house has been um, taken off him. You're going to spend who, who knows how much on, on legal fees, and you're still not going to get anything at the end of the day. I'm going to talk to you about contracts. Anyone in the room who's ever read a contract, stand up. Stand up. Anyone who's ever read one? All the way through. Fantastic. OK. Anyone ever bought anything on the internet, stand up. All the ones who read the contract, sit down. All the ones still standing up. Oh, dear. You take away nothing from this session, lest it be this. Read your contracts. <coughs> contracts are inherently uncertain. There's been lots of cases about how they're interpreted, and there's been lots of cases about what's included and what's not included in them. The whole point about contract law is to try to limit the inherent uncertainty and manage the commercial risk of entering into them. So what is a contract? It's an agreement, but it's an agreement of a particularly special kind. It's an agreement which the courts recognise and are prepared to enforce. For it to be a, a contract, a, a legal contract, the parties need to intend to create legal relations. The, the courts tend to assume, to start with a presumption, that arrangements or agreements between members of the same family aren't legally enforceable. So if you do have inter-family business arrangements, you need to make it absolutely clear that you do intend those arrangements to be legally binding. So contracts are formed when the parties have reached agreement. So the contract terms themselves can be entirely verbal, can be written, can be a mixture of both. And contracts contain express terms and also implied terms. So those are terms that are added by common law or by statute. So one thing that we can do to avoid this uncertainty, one thing we can do to avoid the possibility of representations that we didn't intend to be contract terms coming into the contract is to use something called a whole of contract clause in your drafting. So your whole of contract clause is just simply something which says the whole of the terms of the contract are contained in this document. Misrepresentations, and that can be something which is innocent, careless, or deliberate, then the party who has been wrongfully induced to enter into the contract can claim rescission. That means that the party would be put back into the position that they would have been if they'd never entered the contract in the first place. Standard terms, most of you will use standard terms in the sale of your goods and services. Most of you will see standard terms when you're purchasing goods and services. Most people try to, aim to sell their goods and services on standard terms. Standard terms are for standard jobs, basically. They're for one-off orders. They're for things that you buy. They're for services you commission. The other type of contract that you're gonna see most commonly is something called a framework agreement. So those that, do, that are involved in selling to larger companies, you might see a framework agreement, and that'll be something which is the sort of thing that your customer will send you when they are going to be repeat purchasing from you over a term of, of sometimes many years, typically two to three years, something like that. In business-to-business -business supply agreements, this can lead to something that we call the battle of the form. So basically, you've got sales staff who say, we will only sell to you on our standard terms, and you've got procurement staff at your customer who say, we're only going to buy from you on our standard terms. So you've got to be careful about that because that means that, that possibly, yes, their standard terms will apply. Until very, very recently, I would have been saying to you that if you want to rely on your T's and C's, you actually have to send them to your customer 
at the time that you're entering into the contract. So I would have always said, send them with your quotes and estimates. Because if you want to um, have those apply to the contract, you actually have to physically notify the customer of them. There's been some very recent case law which says, oh, for heaven's sake, in business to business contracts, your customer knows that there will be terms and conditions. And so as long as you say where they can be found or even available on request, they are more likely than not to apply. Best advice would be to say, I I've seen your purchase order. Thanks very much for your purchase order. I don't accept your terms and conditions. Here's ours again. We will only supply on ours. Don't be stealthy about it. Be clear about it. Because if you are going to have a dispute about whether or not they apply, the clearer you've been in your negotiation, the better your argument. The Unfair Contract Terms Act has been amended, but the original was 1977. There are certain things you can't exclude liability for. You can't exclude liability for death, personal injury. You can't exclude liability for fraud or fraudulent misrepresentation. And I spoke a bit earlier about what misrepresentation amounts to. Anything else more or less goes as long as it's reasonable. It depends on the circumstances of the case, depends upon the bargaining power of the parties, depends upon the nature of the goods or services, depends upon the value of the goods or services, depends whether it's a purchase order, whether it's an offer, whether it's acceptance, whether it's a counter offer. Competition law deals with things like um, restriction of, of, of trade into the market. One of the things that the Competition Act says is that um, you can't have an agreement between two entities, you can't have an agreement between two companies about the terms upon which one of them will trade with, with, an, with a third entity who's not part of this agreement. So, so that, those sorts of terms, um, depending, as I say, on the actual product that we're talking about and the size of the market, etc., might well be void because of competition law. If you do trade to consumers, then all this other stuff applies too. Consumers are very different. If you're going to trade with consumers, you need to make sure that your standard terms and conditions of sale um, are compliant with the legislation. Um, you've got to give consumers particular rights. If you are in breach of your contract, if your goods are shoddy, if they fall apart, if they are not on time, the, the remedy that your, your customer is going to have against you is, is damages. When we say damages, we, we mean cash. But quite often... A customer will be jumping up and down in absolute rage, saying, You've, you're on breach of contract because your goods are late. And the answer to that is, what's your loss? Even if there's no exclusion clause, you still only get damages if there's a loss uh, for breach of contract. For every 100 cases, only one of them will go to court. A commercial view is, is likely to be the more sensible one. The other thing to consider, of course, is, is this the loss of a type that I'm insured for? So the best thing to do is if you want to exclude direct losses, negotiate it, show you've negotiated it and record that you've negotiated it. So the, part, the other parties clearly agree to it. Big framework agreements, you might be involved in um, reviewing these, but these are things you should look for first. Term, when does it start, when does it end? What's the notice period? Can either party give notice or is it just them? It's time of the essence. What that means is Time for performance is a fundamental term of the contract. Is there a force majeure clause? It's a clause which says, if those events happen which prevent us, they're, they're things outside our control, and they prevent us from, from performing the contract, they prevent us from manufacturing and delivering the goods, we're not going to be liable for breach. You need to make sure you've got one of those. If you take away one thing from, from this slide, it's don't agree to customers' contracts that have got unlimited liability clauses in them. Contracts can only be made with legal entities. Legal entities are individuals, partnerships, limited liability partnerships, limited liability companies. So know your customer and make sure that you identified them as one of these legal entities. Don't supply them with goods on credit without getting a residential address for them as well as a trading address. If they are one of these other entities, you need to know they're registered number at company's house and their registered office address.
by special request being asked to explain why you don't need to pay your parking fines in a private car park. If the car park is managed or owned or both by a private company and um, you overstay, you have a contract that you can park there for £2 an hour, £5 an hour or whatever it is. Penalty clauses are normally illegal. Your contract is to pay the going rate. If it's £2 an hour, then that's what you're, you're contracted to pay. If you overstay by two hours and don't pay those extra two hours, you owe the precise sum of four pounds. You do not owe them the fine of 120 pounds that they will try and slap on you. I give that to you as my gift. Um, <laughs> right, employment law. There are two aspects of employment law. There's the whole HR side of it, which BPIF does very, very well. The side that I'm going to talk about is, more, is the law, what the law is, which of course is in the back of the HR advisor's mind as well. Human rights is quite a new idea. Employment law comes within the human rights ambit. It, it's partly about whether or not you've paid them the right salary or whether you've paid them redundancy pay, but it's about a whole lot more than that. Okay, these are the main principles in employment law, it's all about reasonableness. Have you behaved in a reasonable manner? Unfair dismissal in particular, laws about unfair dismissal is not to prevent you di dismissing somebody. It's to make sure that you do it fairly. Have you followed a proper procedure? You can only dismiss people for one of the five fair grounds. Can anyone, uh, you'll probably get three out of the five fair grounds. Yes, performance. Conduct, redundancy, statutory illegality, some other substantial reason, which obviously covers a great a multitude of sins. Even something that sounds like a slam dunk must be investigated. You must inform the person what they are accused of. And you should do that by letter for two reasons. One, because it'll all be set out nicely. And two, you've got evidence then that you've done it and you've informed them. Then, of course, you have to give them a right of appeal. Like judge and jury, uh, if you're going to be prosecuted by the police, the police do the investigation, the CPS bring the prosecution, the judge and the jury decide. Same here, you need to separate out. So the disciplinary officer should be somebody different to the investigation officer. And the appeal officer should be somebody different to both of those. Redundancy can be a lot more complicated. If you've got five printers and you want to go down to three, then you're going to have to make a selection between those five. Therefore, you have to have a selection criteria and that has to be fair. Statutory illegality, you might think, you've got a salesman, he's a field sales, he's out in his car all day um, visiting clients, he's lost his license, he can't do his job anymore, <coughs> end of. Not quite. You still need to consult with him because he might say to you, ah, oh, but my wife doesn't work and she says that she's happy to drive me around for the next 12 months. You've got to give him an opportunity to say that. You may say in response, actually, no, what we don't want you going to our best customers and, and your wife sitting in the car park for three hours while you talk to them and you worrying about all your wife's. No, we don't think that works. But you must still give them the opportunity to say that. Right. Discrimination. That's what discrimination is. Less favourable treatment for a reason relating to an individual's protected characteristic. Harassment is a specific different offence. Harassment is unwanted conduct relating to protected characteristic, which has the purpose or effect of violating an individual's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. Protected characteristic. Anybody want to name one? Gender reassignment. Oh, good one. Race. Religion. Age. <laughs> Sexual orientation. Gender. Disability. Marital status is never going to come up. Pregnancy and maternity. Those are the nine protected characteristics. Now you can discriminate both directly and indirectly. Directly, not promoting somebody because of their race much more prevalent is indirect discrimination. A classic example is um, a very laddish culture where everybody goes down the pub after work um, and the women can't because they, 
because they've got to go home to look after the children or that it's just too laddish and so they don't. Um, and guess what? That's where all the real discussions about work go on and that's where people get promoted or they get to... That could be discrimination on the grounds of gender. What is a disability in law? Uh, it is a physical or mental condition that has a long-term substantial detriment to your day-to-day -day living. If it's found that somebody has a disability, uh, you have to consider reasonable adjustments. So it may be that they need to sit down to do their work, or it may be something more. They may say, well, the, reasonable, the adjustment I need is for you not to make me come to work for the next two years. That's not going to be reasonable. You can dismiss somebody with a disability. If the aim is to have somebody in full-time work doing that job, because otherwise it can't be done properly, uh, and, the, and it's proportionate to dismiss that person because you've gone through everything else you could possibly do. The only thing left is to dismiss them. All I'd say is if you're going to dismiss somebody who's disabled, you've got to make sure you go that extra mile and make sure you think about all those extra bits. So pregnant women can walk on water. That's all I'll say about that one. Marital status is never going to come up. Sexual orientation, pretty obvious. Um, age, you're not allowed to have a normal retirement age now. If any of you have got normal retirement ages in your contracts, in your procedures, in your policies, take them out because there is, you cannot have a normal retirement age unless you can justify it and it's very difficult to justify. And the other thing about age is it's any age. In your appraisals every year with everybody, ask them what's your plan for the next, what are your plans for the next five years? And that might start a conversation with that person who may say, well, I, oh, I'd really like to go down to two days a week. What do you think? I don't want to go all together. And then you can have that discussion. Try not to start it. Try to get it brought, brought up in conversation. Religion. Religion now is not just religion. It's religion or belief. So it's very, very broad. It's not just the, your standard um, religions. It's much broader than that. OK, there are the defences. I think we've talked about them. Genuine occupational requirement, say, uh, um, security work at airports so that a woman pats down a woman, for instance, or interpreters or people working with minority groups, you know, is that they, they might, it might have to be a woman or it might have to be a woman of a particular um, ethnic or, or religious um, group. I mean, you're not going to come across them in, your, in the printing world, I don't think. If you're dismissing them for a discriminatory reason, there's no qualifying period, so that goes away. So if you are dismissing somebody who's only been with you eight months, make sure you write to them telling them why you're dismissing them, because that's going to be your first line of defence when they say, oh, well, it was really because I was black that you dismissed me, even though actually, no, it wasn't anything to do with that. It was because you're, you just, your performance didn't come up to scratch. There are some statistics just to give you an idea pointing out that unfair dismissal is by far the biggest number of claims, sex, disability, race, age. And you'll also see that a tiny percentage actually get to tribunal. I just wanted to point out this figure to you here. Four and a half million pounds. This was, it's a race claim, a highly paid, highly skilled doctor, I think she was Greek or Cypriot or something, and she went through, I mean, it was appalling, the story is appalling. The fact is that in unfair dismissal claims, the median award is about four and a half grand, or it was then, it's probably a little bit more now. The, the thing I don't think I said about um, discrimination is not only is there no qualifying period, there's also no cap on the amount of money you can get in compensation. Mm -hmm.